Greetings in the Lord Jesus. He is ever mindful of all that we're going through. The days that we see so many that have compromised, so much upheaval in the world. Some of the things we're going through as the United States moves to an election year and all that goes on with that. But for me, it's time each week to just say how much and how incredibly thankful I am to be able to join you and how truly humbled it is to speak scripture and try and pour that into our lives, review it, chew on it, study it, ask the Holy Spirit to show you the truth for you, and then you own it. All that I can do by the power of the Holy Spirit is to honor him and to honor my family and honor you as well. So let me welcome in our wisdom warriors, our sage warriors, and intercessors from around the world. Uh, when we first started out in 2018, when the Lord said you'd have 120 intercessors to you know, what was in the upper room, that was a challenge. I, I had no idea, but I trusted him. And now we have thousands, not only throughout the United States, but around the world. So I'll show you what we're going to talk about today. <coughs> National War Council. As ambassador of Christ, if you are born again, if you have that experience that Nicodemus was told by Jesus that she must be born again, you are in the family of Christ. He knew you beforehand. He called you. He made provision so that we could be called the righteousness of God in Christ. It's still a concept that certainly the secular realm has no understanding of. And very few within the church structure, I'm talking about denominations. Thankfully, I, in our family, in our family time, it's, it's the ecclesia. It's those that are serious about the word, those that want to eat the meat of the word and be prepared as the five wise virgins. So I posted or had this posted yesterday <clears throat> on, uh, I guess, a couple platforms. War. I had been given a prophetic word last year, and it had to do with Hamas and what would take place and some of the things you see are horrific, certainly overwhelming, and can break your heart. And so he said, I want you to see what's going to take place and record it but you can't talk about it yet. So this will be the first time that I will be able to publicly talk about some of the things next week, even with you know, Luke and Kimberly. They said, exactly what is it? And I said, you'll have to just wait and see. Um, I love my beautiful bride and my son, Luke. Always have, always will. And I put on there, What's relevant about the number five? What is relevant about the number five? So much, I've learned this, people, whether they like Israel, don't like Israel, uh, like the Jews, don't like the Jews, I have learned over the years, and it doesn't take a scientist to understand this, that whatever my father loves, I love. Whatever my father does not love, I do not love. He says he hates sin, especially the sin of pride. So regardless of your feelings, I believe in my heart of hearts that the Lord says what he means and means what he says. And so when he told Abraham, those that bless you, I will bless. Those that curse you, I will curse. I'm surprised the person that occupies the White House is even living right now. Um, you do not pressure another nation. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Next week, I'll talk about it. I've spent, as he asked me to, change what I was teaching on, as he taught me, to just cover things that it's not popular. 
And I don't try to teach what's popular. I teach what he asked me to teach on and then gives me the power of the Holy Spirit to do so. And during the times, it's been a lot of attacks, both physically and spiritually. But that's expected. When you're speaking truth, you're speaking to your family in love. And we, you, me, Luke, Kimberly, all of us can grow in wisdom and knowledge and maturity by the power of the Holy Spirit and the washing of his word, the washing of the water of the word. So I've been talking about five men that had gone through difficult times and asked God to kill them, take their life. Uh, I talked about Joseph and David, that they were promoted, but it took years for it to be fulfilled. And then we covered John the baptizer and we covered Paul. And I talked from scripture. And for those that have followed me, you know, my love for nature. Uh, it's incredible to me uh, how your father and my father uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say that so you understand it. It is from Genesis to Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, and God created, right? He was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus, the Christ. For by him were all things created that are in heaven. Hope to talk on the different realms and dimensions. It's becoming more relevant, more relevant. With portals, wormholes, all things created in heaven and that are in the earth visible and invisible, physical and spiritual, whether they be thrones, that's a, a level within the uh, angelic hierarchy, or domains or principalities or powers, all things, not a few, not those that you think he should have, but all things were created by him and for him. And he, Jesus, is before all things, and by him, all things are held together. They consist is what that Greek word means. So I have talked about from the biblical standpoint. And I think those that I was just commenting to a lady yesterday when I was having some blood drawn. I saw a picture of a German shepherd on the wall. And uh, I watched this show. These guys go out into the wintertime and uh, hot tent camping and they cook with a stove. Well, one of them has a German shepherd. And. It just reminds me how intelligent uh, some of, uh, you know, we people call them pets. I, I call them part of the family. Uh, you can just see in this picture that she had of this German Shepherd, just how smart it is that you, they turn their head and they listen to you and they, they're something else. Um, but nature is like that many, many times that I haven't shared. I haven't talked about the Lord and I share times together in nature. You don't even have to talk. You just have to sit with him and watch and just see the beauty and and thoughts that can come that he'll and he'll teach you that way. But you have to be able to settle down. You have to be able to sit down. And that's hard for some people is to quiet yourself. And those that have written and, and Jim were hanging on to you and, and to Kimberly for your prayers. And, and I've said last week as as a member of your family and love, uh, those that write, uh, I'm just one of the members of the family, is to tell you that if you do not have a prayer language, you don't even, not a prayer language, just if you, a prayer life, and it doesn't have to be much. Uh, when I learned how to pray, the Lord said, would you quit praying and just talk to me? <laughs> it was a kind of a big revelation. And uh, even the fact that I could sit down uh, and talk to him rather than standing up and being so formal. And he, he broke that years and years ago. And it's always respectful. But you have to have a relationship with him at some level, uh, you know, even to the point of Lord help. I mean, that, that that's, he hears you. But read scriptures, uh, have some type of prayer life. And in the word is the washing out of the water by the word, but you also precept upon precept, line upon line is how we grow. 
So I'm going to, by the leading of the Lord, show you everything that was taught before in Scripture. I'm going to try and show you in nature. Why? Because the Lord says, even the heavens declare his glory, and they speak day unto day and today without uttering a word. That's the way nature is. And as we have gone through, and I shared with Shad Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fire, the testing that Joseph went through, uh, the testings that John the baptizer uh, went through in, in the dungeon and finally was beheaded, uh, the apostle Paul, that everything is a testament to some of the things, not all of those. Obviously, these are incredible men, men and women, but they are men and women like you and I. They're, they're not upon us. Some pedestal is to show you that they were like us. So the Bible you know, points out the good, the bad, and the ugly. Today, I, I want to try and close out, I see how we go and how my energy does on let nature say the same thing so that you can understand it. I had taught before uh, those that follow on the uh, pointers everywhere, metamorphosis, you know, changing that transformation and second um, Corinthians 318. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed. That word metamorphosis, you'll see it are changed into the same image from glory to glory even by the Spirit, the capital S of the Lord, not your efforts, not your works, not your money that you donated, not. If you come to him with all of that and say, Lord, didn't we prophesy your name and we did all these things? He's going to say, I never knew you. It's a relationship. And I you know, just, I don't like to go so long, but these things come when I'm sitting and he talks to me. Um, there are different giftings. Uh, in the body. And one of the most intimate that you can receive, and that is why this group, uh, the white hairs, the wisdom warriors, the sage, the intercessors, is so special to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because of me. I am a part of this that he started. Intercessors, think of this a prophet, I understand prophecy. And the Bible says prophecy will one day no longer be. There's healings. Think of all the different giftings that Holy Spirit assigns to each one of us. And I've been used in prophecy, been used in healing and different areas. But the most intimate, intimate for me and the one that I think of myself first and foremost is intercession. An intercessor is invited by the Lord Jesus Christ to sit with him, beside him, and to be a part of what he's doing, to join him in the work that he's doing, not only in yourself and in your family, but in others. So when you intercede, there is an additional factor of closeness with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you sit with him and open yourself up, you're saying, Lord, I don't know who you are going to bring to my heart to pray for, I have a list of people that I pray for. We pray for those that write in and those that donate. We pray continually for you. But then at night, there is that block of time where I sit and say, Lord, bring anyone you want, any situation you want. You can give me details if you want, which I don't really care for all these details. I just tell me who they are. And what it is, and I'll just pray in agreement with you, because you know what is right. <laughs> you know what it is that you want to do, and you're use, or the gifting that you've given to me to join with you in that. So we're in agreement together with that. There are many things in the Old Testament that says, you know, to pray and to move my hand. So he invites you in to say, come with me in your private time and join with me. It's a process. You're not going to tomorrow night unless you have a solid, a good prayer life. And that's what this group is. The National War Council is a group of intercessors around the globe and others that want to learn and mature. So that takes time, but it's just those things he wants me to relate to you that people write say, Jim, I want that intimacy with him that you have. The intimacy that I have with him is because I spend 
hours with him praying for other people or other situations and just praying in agreement with him. That change, that's that word I told you about Greek. It's the 3339. It's used four times. Metamorphosis is to change, transfigure, or transform. And you, you'll recall that Jesus transfigured, and the King James has changed before them in Matthew 17, 2, and Mark 9, 2, a Mount of Transfiguration. And then be not conformed to this world, but transform, metamorph, changed by the renewing of your mind, Romans 2, 2. Your brain, no, your mind, mind, will, and emotions of the soul, which is eternal. And so I had taught on that, and we went through the metamorphosis you, from a caterpillar and, you know, the different stages of that to show you. And, and one of the things that intrigued me is the struggle the butterfly has to have to get out of that cocoon, that clear sheathing that you see, that there are those that have slit that open that had watched them to help the butterfly along. But that struggle within that uh, crystallized you know, cocoon is what strengthens his wings so that when uh, the butterfly is, is outside of that, then it is able to, the strength in the wings is able to fly away. That's the same thing with us as we metamorph, as we are changed. We're struggling against different things. Sometimes it's outwardly, sometimes it's our own. Uh, you know, the sin in our life that he wants to remove. And, and those that write that have addictions, he doesn't condemn you. He wants you to have a better life. He wants you to have a healthier life. He wants those around you not to be in fear or to, you know, you know because of something that you do. Let me say this about those that are just had this. Uh, I believe a, a day or two ago, those that are going through cancer and they're being treated and they feel like they're a burden and uh, a bother and, and, and things like that to their family. Um, I don't know you and I love you and I'm pulling for you and I'm praying for you. Uh, your own family. Uh, it, it's difficult. It's difficult to take care of you know, a, a mother or father or, or others with dementia. Uh, that slowly they they don't even recognize you and know you. They are eternal, though, and they hear what you have to say. So don't think of yourself and, and condemn yourself. Uh, pray and, and seek the Lord and, and the medical advice they're given to you to overcome this uh, and to triumph. But God loves you. God loves you. So let me... Diamonds are forever. I think it was a James Bond movie or something like that. Let's we'll talk about diamonds for a minute. Mysteries in the Bible. Diamonds are forever. Yes, they are. Very beautiful. Mysteries in the Bible. Just to cover a few things that I'm going to get on. I get to the stones and diamonds. The 12 tribes, the 12 stones and the breastplate correspond to, correspond to the original 12 sons of Jacob not to the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, which were later adopted as sons. Uh, it says effectively doubling their inheritance. Uh, but the 12 tribes are each are represented by a stone. Uh, the 12 foundations, the new uh, Jerusalem was walls of Jasper. Uh, the 12 foundations of the new Jerusalem are garnished with the same 12 precious stones as named by John the Revelator, uh, Revelation 21, 19 through 20, for those that listen. While those stones are associated with the 12 apostles, they're also near the 12 gates, which are named for the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. You might ask yourself how well you know Jim Stones. Supposedly you had the revelation given to John. How would you have described uh, the foundation of stones? Most of us know that rubies are red and Emeralds are green, but perhaps not much more. John knew his gems pretty well. Let me say this. When you are in the spirit, the knowledge that you have in the natural, when you are in the spirit, it supersedes. Uh, there is a knowledge 
of understanding. There is also your senses are so much different. And when you see in the spirit colors, and as I've said, the three different languages are, are color, sound, and math, the different formulas of, of the universe. So the colors are uh, unique. But right down to recognizing sardonyx as a specific form of onyx, O-N-Y-X. It says, actually, in the spirit, knowledge is expansive. And there, I didn't know at first, but over the years, when the Lord and I are together, he doesn't have to talk to me. I know what he's saying, and he knows how I respond. Well, just the way it is. So that's the 12 foundations. 12 colors. It is proposed that in the 12 colors of the stones, which are most important, that representative stones, which are chosen for those colors, the stones had to be large enough to engrave the names on the tribes upon. So I want you to keep that in mind. It has to be a stone that you engrave the name upon. Whereas in other contexts, such as a gem inlaid in a ring or smaller or precious stones could be used to represent. Okay. The 12 constellations. It's also proposed that 12 zodiac constellations each had a unique color for the figure that the 12 stones also correspond to those. And the order is so you have constellations, you have the foundation uh, of the New Jerusalem, uh, also in a spectrum that I've talked about when you look at the colors through a spectrum. Same thing with a diamond when it reflects out. Order, the final order discovered should make sense. as a vague requirement, but God's house, a house of order, and the order certainly will not be random. Trouble is, almost every time the 12 tribes are listed, they're given a different order. That is true. Look at Genesis 27 uh, and 49. Look at Numbers 2, Deuteronomy 33, and Revelation 7. A little homework for the Bereans. So the names of the tribes are also engraved on the stones, on the shoulders of the priest, and on the six on each shoulder according to their birth, Exodus 28. Be the most logical order to assume for the 12 stones on the breastplate. So what are you doing all this stone stuff for? Is I wanted to show you how important stones and color are. And you look at the Old Testament. What does that have to do with your teaching? But I try to teach within teaching. So when you look at Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and they're in a specific order. God is a God of order, not chaos. The laws of entropy, going from uh, or you know, something that is structured down into chaos. That's the laws of entropy. So the high priest, I'm showing this to you because it's very relevant, and I'll be talking about things next week. You put on the breastplate. You can see the different stones. You can find these on the on the internet with the breastplate, Urim Therm, that was in a little pouch behind it. And then on the shoulders, the onyx stones, the turban. Okay. So it's not part of a long ago history. This is relevant for today. That's why I'm teaching it to you. So you will, <laughs> the knowledge that we need today that is not being taught in the structural church. It's usually the same thing that they send out from the district or, or, or regional offices in the church. And this is classes going on now. This is the um, rabbinic uh, group with the Temple Institute. Going through the stones, going through the tribes, going through the meanings, going through everything that is identified with color. That's today. They're training Levitical priests today. There are at least 200 now trained, 200 Levitical priests trained and ready, and more being trained all the time. And you can see from Zebulun, Issachar, Judah, the Hebrew, the color, the zodiac, and then the tribe. Okay. So if you look and see your the tribe that you're with, and I've shown that to you in the past. You can also look and see the tribe with it. They have different ones for 
that you can look at. I've been the Zodiac with each house, each tribe having a particular sign. And also I had shown to you and taught Bible in the, in the, in the stars in heaven is that the entire story from uh, the, the Virgo, the Virgin, all the way through Leo, the conquering lion, is told in the stars. And you can see it in the constellation. Okay. Where am I? <laughs> and so let's look at Ezekiel 28, 13. Different colors. And when those colors, uh, light hits those, they ref reflect reflect um, different colors and it is a beautiful it's hard it's kind of like a kaleidoscope that has so many colors but ezekiel 28 13 you were in eden the garden of god every precious stone was your covering sardis tobes and the diamond beryl onyx jasper sapphire emerald they were all crafted in gold, where your settings and your engravings on the day that you were created, they were prepared. So it starts, the prophet starts talking to about the Prince of Tyre. And when it comes to this verse, 20, uh, verse uh, chapter 28, verse 13, then he switches to the King of Tyre. So this is the word for uh, Lucifer who was in the garden. So the, the Prince of Tyre never was in the garden, but in this case, Lucifer was in the garden. Okay, a little more. Diamonds are the most sought after and admired gemstone. The sparkling brilliance that set them apart from all other jewelry. That is true today when diamonds are mined on an industrial scale as it was thousands of years ago when they were a much rarer commodity. Thinking about diamonds. According to the Gemological Institute of America, the Roman historian plainly wrote in the first century AD, diamond is the most valuable, not only of precious stones, but of all things in the world. And there are many uh, that think of diamonds in that way. So the reference to diamonds, I, and you may have heard the term. And again, I, I love to watch those below zero and camping out under the stars. And you can look and when you look up into the sky, it's much different today with all the satellites and junk up there. But you can still see the stars, and they call them like diamonds in the sky. Reverence to diamonds in the sky is literally true. At the heart of many stars and planets are thought to be diamonds larger than any found on Earth. For those looking to the heavens, it is possible to view stars themselves as diamonds, twinkling way in the night, in the night sky. Diamonds are rare, of course, and highly valuable. We're talking about diamonds as they twinkle, right? Just a little, and I won't beat this. Uh, about fifty to sixteen hundred million years ago, a diamond rock could be the oldest material in the world. First discovered around twenty five hundred BCE in India, according to Cape Town Diamond Museum. Let's see, we're number 19, diamonds in the sky. The strong appearance made them highly desirable. By the 4th century B.C., they were being traded with other parts of the world. They're extreme. Why am I covering this? Something that is rare, something that someone wants, something that they want to possess. Diamonds, and I'll show you, go through a process. So the world or, you know, this society today, they crave diamonds. They crave which is that which is beautiful and expensive. Extreme rarity meant that only the wealthy could afford them, and diamond became the ultimate status symbol among the medieval elite. It was only in the 19th century when more extensive diamond deposits were found in South Africa that they became accessible to the general public. Diamonds can form with the help of ancient salt water, say researchers who have identified the gems that crystallized with the help of oceanic crust dating back to as far as 200 million years ago. This finding can help solve the long-standing mystery of how diamonds form. 
and shed light on how matter gets cycled between the surface and the deep earth, scientists say. Diamonds also may form under high pressure and temperature. And give you any indication? Something so rare, something so beautiful, something so desired is formed under high pressure and temperature that is desirable. Who desires it? Certainly God of this world and our Father. If you're made in his image and you have been through the processes and he has been refining you, we'll cover that in the end. Start thinking in those terms. At the site of meteorite impacts from outer space, not from Earth, right? High pressures at the site of the meteorite impacts. Diamonds formed during impact may be relatively young. Some meteorites contain stardust, debris of the death of a star, which may include diamond crystals. One such meteorite is known to contain tiny diamonds over 5 billion years old. These diamonds are older than our solar system. I quote these when I do research. I have no uh, confidence in the dating these people do. Carbon testing and all the other. I have no confidence in it, but that's my personal. So to show that to you, I found a nice asteroid impact, the deep, the deep source, the continental plate. Diamond stability zone, way at the bottom. Formed in the dark, formed all alone. Nobody's watching, nobody's looking under extreme pressure. Hidden away till it explodes. It's a volcano, the Kimberlet volcano, miles of rock removed by erosion over millions of years, the modern landscape surface. So it says down in this red part, the Kimberlite pipe. So when there's a volcano, earthquakes, how diamonds are formed. While carbon normally exists at graphite on the Earth's surface, it can form diamonds at much greater depths, 100 miles or more, I'll cover more, where temperatures and pressures are extremely high, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, according to the Smithsonian Magazine. In a few places, diamonds bearing material from these depths has been carried up to the surface by volcanic eruptions. Some of this material was subsequently washed into the riverbeds where diamonds were first found. So it says that you know, nowadays it's uh, diamond bearing rock, which is called Kimberlite after the mining town of Kimberly in South Africa, where it was first found. Okay. Through decades of study, we now understand that diamonds, such as the rare Blue Hope diamond, is a large colorless color, and the more common yellow Cape diamonds have different origins within the deep earth. So, just a, sometimes you feel alone. No one's around. No one cares. No one's listening to you. God doesn't hear you. Assume you think that. All the while, you're being formed. High pressure, temperatures. That's, uh, they call it the King's Jewel. Hope Diamond is a 45.52 carat diamond <laughs> extracted in the 17th century. So they come forward out of their heat and their pressure, earthquakes, volcanoes, extremely high temperature. I'll cover a little more later. The ice giants, I found this interesting. The main may conjure up images of tokenesque creatures, but is the name astronomers use to categorize the outermost planets of the solar system, Uranus and Neptune. These ice giant giants do not receive enough press. All the attention goes to their larger siblings, mighty Jupiter and magnificent Saturn. At first glance, Uranus and Neptune are just bland. Boring balls of uninteresting molecules. A closer examination, hiding beneath the outer layers of those planets, there may be something spectacular, a constant rain of diamonds. A constant rain of diamonds. And I think how we put so much emphasis on the values here on Earth, 
And even with gold, which I'll talk about, uh, the streets are made it's like asphalt in heaven. The streets are made of gold. Uh, diamonds here are rare. It's saying some of these planets may even have uh, constant rainfall of diamonds. Diamonds are the hardest known materials on Earth and are ranked the highest on the Mohs hardness scale. All types of natural diamonds are entirely scratch resistance. Remember, I said pay attention to that because they had to engrave the name on the stones. Well, if it was a diamond, you couldn't engrave the name. So that's always a hint. When you're studying things and people make assumptions, put all the scriptures together. The diamond is too hard for you to scratch the surface. So it's entirely scratch resistance to any other materials and materials. The only item that can scratch a diamond is another diamond. Diamonds are not flammable and have the highest thermal conductivity of any natural material requiring extremely high temperatures to burn. 1,562 degrees Fahrenheit and melt at 7280 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So I wasn't going to cover this, but let me quickly try to. I, for, for me, I know the prophetic call. I know times I'm used in other things, but I try to stay in my lane to try to stay the, you know, what's the one thing you, you know, and that is intercession. And I love that part of it. The others come out of that, but intercession. I'm saying I'm not a dream interpreter. Uh, people, all people read books and suddenly they can interpret all the dreams. This is one I had in February 2006. Still don't understand that, and I don't go seeking out to try to find out what it means. But this is a dream I had, and I'm pointing this out to show you how you can have consecutive dreams in a night or, cons or, or dreams once, and then a few weeks, a few years later, the dream I was standing in front of a strange-looking wall. It was as long as I could see going in both directions. So he took me and said, I want to show you something. And we were looking in two different directions, and it looked like a wall in front of me. It looked like a flow of water with white caps, as you may see an ocean at night. If any of you look at the ocean, you see those white caps out. This thing was like a on the wall at first. I was looking at it, and it looked like a river flowing with white caps. It was smooth and sparkling from various points. I could sense the Lord was standing to my left and a little bit higher. And I was down now on this bank. And in front of me, this thing that went this way, like on a wall, suddenly was like a river flowing in front of me. I couldn't see his face. I, But with the radiance, it says, uh, I knew it was him and brightness came from him that made the wall or this stream sparkle in places like white caps. So as we were standing there and the stream was going uh, because of his glory, the, his brilliance, I wasn't looking back at it. I could see the stream. So he told me, he said, go to the stream. And I knew to place my hand in it. He said, go to the stream. Uh, I'll just tell you what happened, sir, and all this stuff. But I, I, I logged these going back to this is my pomegranate. This is 2006. He said, I want you to go in and uh, reach your hand in the stream. Okay, I didn't know anything, but I looked like water and white caps. It was beautiful, like just amazingly beautiful. So I put my hand in when I did, something formed, and I pulled it out, and it was long like a crystallite looking thing I'd seen before, like on Superman or something, long green crystallite, but this was clear. I didn't, it was probably about six, seven, eight inches long. And so I put it back in. He said, reach in and get something different. So I reached in and pulled out. When I pulled out, it was like the size of a pomegranate, and it was a diamond. It just sparkled. It looked like a diamond, sparkled. I said, I didn't know what he wanted me to do. And he said, put it in your pouch. When he said that, I didn't know. I had, a, like, I was carrying, like, a little satchel. So I put it in there. He goes, get another one. So I reached in, and this is, I'm thinking to myself, I don't, I don't even know what this is about. I don't want to grab anything too big or I don't know what, but I know I'm safe because he's telling me to do this. And I realized this river, this stream is diamonds. So I reach in, they would form and I pulled another one out about the same size as the other. 
um, like a pomegranate. And he said, put it in the sack. It's okay. And I was thinking to myself, boy, that's a lot. I don't need any more. I, you know, I didn't know what it's about because he wasn't explaining at that time. This was 2006. And so I said, Lord, I've, I've, I've had enough. I, I, I don't need anything else. I don't, I don't want any more. Dream ended. And the next night, he came to me. The very next night, Lord took me back to the same wall down in the stream. And again, I did not know why I needed more. He said, I want you to get more. Not wanting to be greedy, I asked the Lord, why do I need more? And what was I to do with the ones I already had? He did not answer. Nevertheless, I could tell he really wanted me to take additional diamonds. I took three more, the same size as the previous night. Thus giving me five beautiful, priceless diamonds. The dream ended. So I've told others before that I have seen, and it is in heaven, that when oceans wash onto the shoreline, uh, they often wash up pearls that are just beautiful pearls. And if you walk on them, it kind of like mashes down, but they come right back up. But uh, it's about diamonds. So they're tested by fire. Are you tested by fire? Am I tested by fire? What do we cover in all those scriptures? Gold, 417 times in 361 verses. Proverbs 17, 3. The finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. Proverbs 17, Proverbs 27, 21. As a finding pot for silver, and the furnace for gold, so is a man or a woman to his praise. What he's saying, if you want to be tested, let men praise you. Let your popularity go up. Not when you're down, people criticize you, but when everything is going well, everybody's telling you how wonderful you are. Be careful. Be careful. There's another one that says, he who thinks he's staying, take heed lest he fall. Gold is a chemical element easily recognized by its yellow metallic color. It is valuable because of its rarity, resistance to corrosion, electrical conductivity, malleability, ductility, and beauty. Think of these traits as in a person, right? The testing and the refining that you're going through. If you ask people where gold came from, most will say uh, you, you obtained it from a mine, pan for flakes in a stream, or extracted from seawater. However, the true origin of the element predates the formation of the earth. Gold is not native to our planet alone. It is a cosmic traveler that finds its roots in the cataclysmic events occurring in the far reaches of the universe. The birth of gold is linked to the dramatic demise of massive stars and explosive supernovas and neutron star collisions. There are those that legitimately today uh, have designed equipment so that they can uh, uh, shoot uh, up at a rocket and land on a uh, asteroid as it travels and mine gold from it and other precious jewels. So that's gold, right? Earthquakes play a significant role. As a shifting fault rapidly decompresses mineral rich water, when the water vaporizes, veins of quartz and gold deposit onto the rock surfaces. Similar process occurs with volcanoes, almost like we had talked about with diamonds. I have so much on that, but I'm not going to go through all of it. The gold quartz vein, and I'll I'll cover with pearls, but also, you know, gold has fool's gold. So if you look at fool's gold and cultured pearls, man-made, think of that in the church. Think of those that uh, Paul warned about. Said they came out from among us, but they weren't part of us. Fool's gold. They can look like gold, but doesn't mean they are gold. Two more pearls. Most jewelry is fashioned out of precious metals and jewels that are found buried in the earth. Pearls found inside a living creature covering the different aspects of nature. That which is uh, naturally for meteorites and uh, for millions and millions of years. Now something that is created in a living organism. Pearls are a result of a biological process. 
the oyster's way of protecting itself from foreign substances. Clams and mussels can also produce pearls, but that is much rarer occurrence. It is common to believe that pearls are formed when the grain of sand enters the oyster. However, this has recently been disputed as a myth. While it is technically possible for a grain of sand to be at the center of the pearl, the oyster species that produces pearls are found on sandy ocean or freshwater floors and have the ability to expel sand and other objects like small pieces of seashells. I thought you'd want to know that. <laughs> Most jewelry is fashioned out of precious metals and jewels. They're found buried in the earth, as I said. Biological process. Okay. So I read you what was on the screen. <laughs> the majority of natural pearls are formed in oysters as a response to a parasitic intruder. The drill worm is one of them. It's kind of like the oyster getting a splinter. The oyster's natural reaction is to cover up that irritant by encapsulating the interloper, thereby protecting itself. The mantle covers the irritant with layers of the same narcic substance that is used to create the shell. These concentric layers of narc uh, the, the narcic will eventually form a pearl. <laughs> the majority of natural pearls are formed in arches response to a, that drill worm. Okay, and there's some. Just give you an idea. Natural pearls are rare, being the only jewels in the world created by a living creature. Unlike gems that are formed in soil, natural pearls do not require polishing or other human in intervention to enhance their value. The Holy Spirit does his work, not other humans to work on you. It would typically take an oyster at least 24 months to make a natural pearl that is about 1.9 inches, 0.19 inches in, di in diameter. I'm going to like if you, uh, some playing cards, like playing cards, uh, stack about 20 of them up, and that's the diameter of it. Pearls uh, produced by archers come in a variety of colors, and including, understand this, please, teaching within the teaching, a message within the message. So these pearls, right, they come in a variety of colors. <laughs> All pearls matter. White, black, gray, red, blue, and green. While most of these colors can be found all over the world, black pearls are indigenous to the South Pacific. Cultured pearls. Cultured pearls are the result of an operation of pearl oysters called grafting. Graft consists of introducing after an incision, a mother of pearl nucleus onto the animal, along with a small piece of elithium. I have it down at the bottom. Uh, I'll tell you what that is. From the mantle, the archer sacrificed for this purpose. So E-P-I-T-H-E-L-I-U-M, for those that know how to pronounce everything, I don't have a, a lady. See, Rob said, you know, some of the words you pronounce, and I don't mean to be, yeah, they're just different. They're, they're funny. And I say uh, everything I pronounce is different. Being a Cajun, I remember uh, my mother's best friend was from up north, and she used to she said, I'm going to make you a, a, a mayo sandwich. I had no idea what a mayo. I said, I'm a whole mayonnaise sandwich. Goes, well, it's the same thing. And she used to call crawfish uh, crayfish. So they were just different terms. She was real funny. But that ethylene is a tissue, is a thin continuous protective layer uh, packed around the cell. So they take a piece of that and put it in there. So they have cultured pearls. Let's finish out with this one. Olive oil, All right? Well, over 2000 years ago, olive oil was made by grinding and crushing. There we go. Fresh olives into a paste or slurry using stone mills of diverse types. To separate the oil from the pulp, pits, and other solids, collectively referred to as pomace, P-O-M-A-C-E, the paste was placed into woven baskets or bags, and the baskets themselves were then pressed. Hot water would be poured over the pressed bags to wash out the remaining oil. 
as the olives were pressed, the liquid was typically drained into a stone settling tank where the oil would rise to the top and separate from any remaining water and particles. The olive oil would then be skimmed off the top and stored in terracotta pots for later use in cooking, medicines, religious ceremonies, and more. There it is. There is the grinding and crushing. So you take an olive, and I'll show you how to get them. And so you take that olive to get something like extra virgin olive oil or olive oil that can be used in many different things, and you have to crush it first. First step in making olive oil is surprise, surprise, harvesting the olives. Typically, when making extra virgin olive oil, olives are harvested in the green or the immature uh, fruit ripeness phase on the verasion, V-E-R-A-I-S-O-N phase, when olives are just transitioning from green to purplish in color, which means they are just beginning to ripen. Riper olives can also be used to make extra virgin olive oil. They just produce a milder ripe fruity style oil with a lower polyphenol content. See, if you're an olive up in that tree and they're going to come to you one day and just shake you and shake you, uh, put you in a basket. I'm asking you to think when you see these things, we've covered scripture. Now look at nature that has the same message in some areas, but you have to put yourself in the place of a pearl and place of gold and place of olive oil. Extracting olive oil from the olive fruit grinding. If the olives are washed, they undergo an extraction process that grinds them up and separates the olive from the olive pomus. Grinding is the crushing of the olive fruit pits and all to a thick paste that sort of resembles cooked oatmeal in appearance and texture. This process can be done by several different sorts of machines. It says some olive makers still use traditional millstone powered by motors. It says there's machines that crush and grind olives with stainless steel hammers, knives, or disc. Okay. Hey, why are you covering olives? Well, it's in the Bible, isn't it? Grinding. Those olives are going to make something beautiful, I mean, for the anointing. Remember David when he was anointed? I think I have it in here. Virgin, extra virgin olive oil. He's my favorite guy. There he is. He's working hard. The way they had done olives in the past. Extracting the olives. Picking and cleaning the first step in this. You know, extracting olive oil from the olive fruit. They're washed and they go an extraction process that grinds them up and separates the olive oil from the olive almonds. Okay. I say on the left, the old, and that would be the trough it would be in. Some on the right, the more modern. So let me see if I can get through this how quickly. I know <laughs> nature's way. All right. Let's take the same thing. That we looked at diamonds hidden 430 miles beneath the earth's surface separate and alone process of crystallization under extraordinary heat and pressure produces the most sought out and admired gemstones in the world that is created right so those that are most sought out went through extraordinary heat and pressure they've been going through the heat the pressure and the stress felt like you've been Tested by fire, diamonds are the hardest known materials on earth and ranked as the highest. And I haven't shared that with you. All types of scratch resistance, they are not flammable and have the highest thermal conductivity of any natural material requiring extremely high temperatures to burn. So now try to think from a diamond to yourself. Diamonds symbolize in the Bible innocence, perfection, purity, and eternal love scriptures and nature tells us the story father son holy spirit and of you and i the refractive index is incredibly high allowing light dispersion into a spectrum of colors 
their clear appearance and resilience are traditionally connected with pure light, endurance, truth, and invincibility. Diamonds were associated with lightning and believed to be products of electrical strikes. That's some of the folklore. In the Bible, diamonds are a beautiful symbol of love, dedication, and affection. They show admiration and respect to those they are intended to and are the ultimate gemstone for engagement and wedding rings. Their unique properties make them powerful, hard, and indestructible, representing a new life and unbreakable bond between partners, male and female. Right? Till death do us part. Uh, other than save the greatest thing I had was the gift that the Lord gave to me to have uh, my wife, my best friend, and then Luke through her. So the Hebrew word from which we get uh, the English for the stone, it denotes something that can prick like a thorn or, or a thorn bushy or something. And is that sharp? They would use that word when they would uh, uh, scroll in like clay. Uh, the, the clay tablets uh, for that. So that process that you may go through, or a diamond goes through, love, dedication, affection, it's powerful, it's hard. Hard means it's resistant to evil. Hard, right, is uh, you will stand your ground in the power of the Holy Spirit. Indestructible. Uh, we can do all things through Christ Jesus, right? New life, we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The bond between partners, male and female. Produces that something beautiful, and that's sought out. That's why it's sought out. That's why the devil wants you to destroy you, and God cherishes you as one of His own because of the process you've been through to form who you are today and continue for all of us. Gold. Any you know, references to gold in the Bible relate to its material value and importance in ancient times. Gold was considered a precious metal, was often used as currency or as a symbol of wealth and power. For example, the book of Genesis, Joseph is given a gold chain as a symbol of honor and authority by the Pharaoh. Same thing with Daniel when he was offered uh, the ch gold chain. Psalms 19.10, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. He's talking about the word of God, talking about scripture. And what is scripture? And the word became flesh, the word manifest among us, right? Jesus is the word. So it's sweeter than that. Psalms 119, 127. Therefore, I have loved your commandments above gold. Yes, above fine gold, your commandments, the word of God. He was talking about the Torah at that time. These passages highlight the symbolic importance of gold in the Bible indicating this value extends beyond material possessions and wealth. I'm talking to you. <laughs> Gold is also used to represent spiritual concepts such as faith, purity, and God, our Father's divine presence. One of the most prominent spiritual interpretation of gold is its association with faith. Gold symbolizes the faithfulness and steadfastness of believers who, like gold, Endure trials and hardships, but emerge with a refined and strengthened faith. Gold represents purity and holiness of the ecclesia and the refinement process of burning away impurities, leaving behind pure gold. So when the impurities are gone, sin, what he's doing is making you from glory unto glory unto glory. God often uses trials and challenges in our life to refine us spiritually, making us pure and holy. Not by works, by his process. The symbolic meaning of gold in the Bible reflects this spiritual refinement process. Just as gold is purified by fire, believers are purified through trials and sufferings. The Apostle Paul writes in his letter, These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies as gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day. Remember the day 
when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. First Peter 1 7. So I'm trying to teach without ever having to teach. I'm just showing you nature. Okay. I'm sure I missed a lot of this stuff. I don't know where I'm at my notes anymore. There's a pearl again. Pearl is mentioned two times in Pearl, eight times in the Bible. So, Jesus talking, Matthew 13, 45 to 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Verse 30, 46, who, when he or she has found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he or she had and bought it. <laughs> Who is the pearl of great price? He goes two ways. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, but you are also remember he said, when a pearl was said, I will leave the 99 and go after the one sheep. You are so loved and so important. Things have fallen apart all around you, and you don't understand why. He's still in control. And it doesn't mean you've messed up, doesn't mean you brought this on yourself, doesn't mean some sin is too too much that he can't forgive. Those are the accusations of evil. And the people around you, like Job's three friends. Revelation 21, 19 through 21. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. First with Jasper on, and it talks about the different elements, right? The sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, the tenth, verse 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Remember? <laughs> See if I have this in here. So the 12 gates were 12 pearls, massive, right? Each of the gates that was one single pearl. I tease all the time. Uh, I think I have it in here. Uh, Revelation 21 21, there were 12 gates were 12 pearls. Uh, I tease that my Cajuns are still looking for the oyster that produced the, <laughs> those pearls. <laughs> the, uh, the oysters are popular down in uh, probably a lot of places, but I know down in Louisiana, New Orleans, we uh, when I entertain uh, business associates and others, they love to go and get the oysters and things. So my Cajun friends are still looking for those oysters that produce that pearl. So it's just a story. This is a true story. The fisherman, whose identity remain, remains undisclosed, had been diving in search of clams when he stone, stumbled upon this extraordinary find. The giant clam, 75 pounds, <laughs> be looking for that too, contained a magnificent pearl, which would later be named the Pearl of Laotus, T-Z-U, or the Pearl of Allah, really. Yeah, he's from that part of the world. The incredible rare gem weighing approximately 14,100 carats and 9.45 in, in diameter displays the magnificent beauty and a rarity of natural pearls. It's obviously a set apart. Its formation is primarily due to the giant clams natural process where layers of calcium carbonate and in the were deposited to produce the shimmering and iridescent appearance. That's the one thing natural pearls do not need to be polished. Okay. Pearls are viewed in the Christian faith as symbols of value and wealth. According to the International Gem Society, natural pearls are extremely rare to come by and harvest. This significantly increases their price tag. Likewise, as Jesus stated, Matthew 7, 6, do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So many times my new life on campus in college would go down to the French Quarter and just, and I'd tell them, you can do that, but uh, they'd get chased by Hare Krishnas and I'd get in fist fights. I said, you're, you know, let the Lord lead you, but just don't go there and say, we're, this is what we're going to do because you're giving them Wealth that is, you know, they're just going to trample on it. They don't care. Pearl is nine times is the Greek 3135, a proverb. Now, understand this is strongest concordance. 
It's a proverb to thrust the most sacred and precious teaching of the gospel upon the most wicked and abandoned men, women. This is incompetent as they are through their hostility to the gospel to receive them. So they're not going to receive it and thus to profane them. In other words, you're giving these wicked people. It's like going to Babel or Babel. They don't want, you know, they're not going to listen to that. That's, I found that interesting as I was looking for a definition of a pearl, and it gave me the proverb in Strong's Concordance. Okay. Endurance and prosperity. Discovered pearls are the only gem produced by living organism, oysters. They form around sand grains or parasites that have invaded the oyster in our reaction to injury. Pearl layer protects the oyster until it is out of harm's way. But after the ordeal, a beautiful stone is left behind. Similarly, Christians being God's creations are tainted by their sinful nature. All of us, starting with me, even with the inherited inclination to evil within us, the pearl symbolizes we can emerge victorious and beautiful in God's sight. Ephesians 2, 1 through 6. Purity and holiness. In pearl formation, the stone is first embedded in easily corrupted flesh, and then is separated and cleansed from its environment. This process has been taken as a symbol of purity, beauty, and holiness, according to the Bible and Christianity. Bad company corrupts good morals. If you're hanging around with the same people that drug you down in the first place, once you get saved, don't hang around them again. Find some new friends. Find like-minded people that love the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is com compared to pearls because likewise believers are in this corrupt world, but they must be separated. God makes the church, the ecclesia, pure and holy within an abyss of sin, just like these gemstones. Purified and cleanses. That doesn't get us salvation. We are saved. This is a sanctification process to get rid of some of the junk in our life. John 15, 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. I don't know how many times my bride says, I don't know why they were so mean to me. And I will tell every time, baby, <laughs> the Bible is very clear. You're either filled with the Spirit of God or the Spirit of the Spirit of Antichrist. Some may know that they're filled with the devil and like that. Others may not know they're filled with the devil, but that spirit within them does not like you. I'm talking to you, my family. If you feel that you've been treated misfairly, nobody likes you, you try to apply to med school, you're the only one that doesn't get where you want to go, all those things, you are in the palm of his hand. He loves you more than life itself because he gave his life for you. I'm praying that the move to Tucson is will reveal to you the blessings that the Lord had, had prepared ahead of time. Salvation. Pearls can also signify God's salvation. Orchards contain pearls and are usually found at the bottom of the ocean. They must be lifted from the bottom of the sea to retrieve the precious stones. Does that sound familiar? God must take the church, the pearl, away from what is ungodly. Isaiah 59, 19 says, How the enemy comes in like a flood. Right? Yes, it does. Psalms 18, 4 through 6 then explains how at present the church's beauty is hidden away, but God will come and lift it up. I hope you're understanding this, that the whole message of the last month was for you. He changed everything, and I will do that anytime he wants to speak to you. He knows you're down. He knows you're bummed out. He knows you're discouraged. He knows you want to give up. Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. Value? Heard of you in the Christian faith as symbols of value and wealth. You're more precious than fine gold to him. According to the International Gem Society, natural pearls are extremely rare to come by and harvest. This significantly increases their price. Likewise, Jesus stated, did not give what is holy, right? So, olive oil. Bible olive oil is mentioned several times as the oil used for Lighting lamps, Leviticus 24.2, Exodus 27.20. Olive oil was also used for anointing oil, Exodus 30, 23 through 25. 
and as part of the grain offering, Leviticus 2, 1 through 10. Kings were anointed with oil, olive oil as a sign that they were chosen by God to rule. 1 Samuel 16, 1. As important ingredient in the recipe for anointing oil, olive oil was used to sanctify the priests, Exodus 29, 7, the tabernacle and all its furnishings, Exodus 49. Olive oil was also used in cooking. <laughs> we use olive oil. And Kimberly is a great cook. Olive trees grew in Israel, Deuteronomy 8, 7 through 8. And the people in that region used the oil from pressed olives as people in other cultures might have used butter or animal fat. <laughs> we use a lot of animal fat uh, down in Louisiana. In the old days of cooking, lard is what we used. Olive oil was an important part of Jewish cultures because of its many uses. Its cent centrality to much of Jewish life, olive oil was sometimes used as a symbol of richness, joy, and health. I'm talking about olives, but I'm talking about you and me. Oop, my bride. Jeremiah 31, 12 and Hebrews 1 and 9. Times of judgment are described, described as a season when the olive oil fails. Joel 1, 10. Here we go. Olive oil can also be seen as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' parable of the ten virgins, Matthew 25, 1 through 13, the five wise virgins in the wedding had made sure they had olive oil for their lamps as they waited for the bridegroom. Five foolish virgins did not think ahead and had bought oil no time. So it shows that when the bridegroom came, the five had to go buy oil. And I have pointed out how could they buy oil if you had to have Mark of the Beast. So it wasn't at that time. Olive oil. Jesus gives the point of the parable. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Matthew 25, 13. At the end of the age, when Jesus come back, some will be ready for his arrival. Illustrated by the five wise virgins. Others will not be ready, symbolized by the five foolish. Considering the olive oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit, faith, we could say that only those who have the Spirit or faith in Jesus are truly ready for Jesus' second coming. I'm not going to get into this. I wanted, let me, these two scriptures, I'll close. What I have covered for the last month or so, and I, people written say I don't understand it, and they're asking me for answers. And I started this whole thing on why do bad things happen to good people? And I, I'm candid and, and truthful. I said, I have no idea. I know some of the reasons, but only God knows, and he didn't answer Job. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as high the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. Matthew 16, 25 through 26 says, and this is just how different it is. In order to save your life, you have to lose it. You know, so take Matthew 16, 25 through 6. In order to gain life, you have to lose life. That's also in Mark 8, 35 and Luke 9, 24. Romans 8, 7 through 11 is that carnal mind is not subject to the spirit of God, but the spirit, if the spirit of God dwells in you. So the spirit of Christ knows so that there's a war going on at all times. Galatians 5, 17, for the flesh, the carnal man fights against lust, against the spirit, capital S, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, so that they cannot do the things you would. That lust is Greek 1937, used 16 times. It means to keep the craving turned upon a thing, to set one's heart upon, to have a desire for, long for, absolutely to desire, James 4, 2, to lust over covet of those things. So the carnal man does all those things, and trying to lure you away, and the Holy Spirit is within us to fight that. There are many more, the testing of the righteous, and uh, script, scriptural 
humility, but I believe I'm going to stop at that today. I wanted to take the time today to finish it up. We went through scriptures throughout Old Testament, New Testament, that when people tell you that there are many ways to God, they're lying. If they tell you that if you're going through difficulties, you're not a you know you're not living right. They're lying because you have a successful, carefree life, quote unquote, as they say. And God wants always good things to happen for you. Uh, he does, but that's not the reality of life. If you are being tested and tried, so I showed you in Scripture. I showed you with diamonds. I showed you with gold. I showed you with pearls. I showed you with olive oil in nature. So even a simpleton should be able to look and see what goes in nature also is the way God speaks and what he does. He wants us to be like him. Not because he's full of rules. Don't do this. Don't do that. He wants us to have a healthier and a better lifestyle while we're here and to pass that uh, lifestyle on to those that we love and to teach them uh, the ways of this world, uh, always trying to get ahead, always you know, trying to outdo each other. God says in, in order to be the head, you have to be the servant. Don't go and sit in the front of the table, go in the back of the room. So his ways are different. So I wanted to point those to you and, and let you think on those. The Lord willing, next week I'll talk about uh, at the Easter is about the time he wanted me to do it. And so next week I'll talk about why did Hamas start the war and, and what's actually going on today that uh, State Department and the, these people have no clue. So thank you. We are so humbled by do something. Give something to somebody so that you are not like this. Open a door. Pull out a chair. Say thank you. People you, know, you, you see working, give them you know, a drink or a glass of water or something. When you have nothing to give, the widow had two pence and she gave what she had. It's not only the money. It's what do you do to get outside of yourself to help someone else out? To, like I have said, I took my teams for years during Thanksgiving and Christmas to pass out you know, food to those who came to the food banks and things. Um, we are so truly grateful for those that give and donate but those that you listen and take in and do something for somebody uh, if it's clothes you have that are cluttering up your closet you know, uh, don't go dump them in a box for the goodwill find someone uh, maybe a church somebody but do something to help if you say I don't have any money to give I'm not asking money for I'm speaking to you as a family member to say, stop looking always at yourself and try and do something to bless somebody else with. And I'll say this, and you probably won't hear this from other teachers or whatever they call them. Kimberly and I, and Luke, we subside on what the Lord gives to us. I'm on the fixed income of social security and that's it. But we do not, buy things and go to dinners and frivolous, all those types of things. It's just the way we do. But when you're going through a struggling time or a difficult time, don't send me something when you need it more than, than we do. Um, the Lord is faithful, but you know, you, you send us something and you still, you got about $200 in rent or food. And, and those out there know, on several occasions, we sent the money back to you. We said, it's not about the money. It's about a family and us teaching you and loving you. And yes, it takes finances to do all this stuff, but that's not what my heart is in. And if it ever came to that, I'm done. I'll go back to the cave. 
So we want you to give and, and, and do, if it's not to, to, to our ministry, to somebody. Um, you know, cook a meal for, for an, uh, an elderly family or something, but do something. Uh, instead of me, 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 even though you're going through trials, tribulations, tough times, just do something. Just say a prayer. You say, you know, I'm not a big prayer or anything. Uh, please help so-and-so. I hope you take that in the right heart. We are called and it was to teach and never knew that it would evolve into a family and, and the love of this family. I don't know if there's others like that, but we do consider that. Uh, and many do not fit into the family style. We do not criticize each other. We do not uh, discuss all these doctrines. I present to you what is out there and let you make up your own mind. But we are so very, very thankful. I, with Kimberly and I, we continue to pray for you. Continue to pray for your family, the peace, physical and germs and all the diseases coming across the border. And you probably, maybe in the news, I read about Haiti and all the, that's coming here. I told you that two years ago that they were going to send the voodoo and the warlocks and medicine men over here. So we're praying and we pray for this nation. Until I see you the next time, may he bless you.